Welcome to Eye Contact. I'm Sean Hennehan. Today I'm very pleased to be speaking with Dr. Susan Jacob, who will tell us everything we need to know about lens explantation. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Sean. Now, the rate of IOL explantation seems to be going up. Why is that? Right. That's a good question, Sean. You know, uh, earlier we used to come across uh, more of late uh, uh, dislocations or subluxations of lenses, which were the main cause for IOL explantation, or maybe uh, just a translocation of the same IOL. But now we're seeing more IOL explantations for different reasons, and one of the reasons, of course, in today's society is patient dissatisfaction with the vision, either the quality or the quantity uh, of vision that they're getting, or uh, the, the actual results not matching up to what they had expected prior to surgery. So that's becoming a major cause now, uh, and especially with the advent of multifocals, I think this is taking, uh, making it more demanding for both the patient and the surgeon, uh, having to undergo an IOL explant immediately after a surgery that has, that was expected to offer a lot to the patient is quite a tough situation. Of course, there are other reasons as well, such as uh, you know uh, the IOL opacification, which is again being seen more often now, and also um, just just uh, the late dislocations, as we mentioned earlier. Really, tell us more about the increase in opacification. Yeah, so uh, you know, with the greater numbers of uh, endothelial keratoplasties being done in the form of DZX or DIMX or PDX, uh, so you have this situation where there's a large air bubble left in the patient's eye, and if the patient has a hydrophilic intraocular lens implanted, uh, that can lead on to opacification, calcification of the intraocular lens, and so on, and that kind of causes a difficulty. It may not uh, decrease it too much in some cases. It may decrease it quite substantially in some cases, and those cases uh, would require an explantation later on. Now, before you're doing your explantation, you want to make sure that there aren't other explanations for loss of vision. Tell us about the workup before you consider explantation. Right, that's absolutely crucial because if you're doing it for the purpose of visual dissatisfaction, you need to make sure there's nothing else. So uh, you need to look for other obvious factors such as maybe just a simple dry eye. Uh, you know, so do a complete dry eye evaluation, make sure that the tear film is smooth so that you know that the, what, what, uh, that the patient has actually attained their best uh, you know, possible visual acuity. The other thing is to look for macular pathologies, which is also very obvious. So do a macular OCT, do a corneal topography, do an abrometry, check for the contrast sensitivity of the patient because sometimes the patient may be complaining uh, even despite having 6-6 vision. So see if it's the contrast sensitivity that he's uh, more bothered about. Uh, ask her, take a good history, uh, look for microtropia, small squints, uh, you know, history of amblyopia. Maybe the patient never had a very good visual potential right from the beginning. So these are some of the things that you always need to check in every patient. Now the patients that are complaining about poor vision that is associated with the IOL, are those mostly multifocal patients? Uh, well, uh, not necessarily, but uh, uh, multifocals do play a, a substantial role in such cases. Uh, uh, they can be associated with this kind of uh, kind of waxy vision sometimes a loss of contrast sensitivity of course happens you can have photic phenomena you can have glare and halos you can have dysphotopsias some of which can be very disconcerting to some patients um, uh, some of them do neuroadapt and get over it but those who are more specific or as we say a type a personality they would not like that those uh, kind of visual phenomena to be in their uh, line of sight. So they, they may uh, want to get uh, rid of that and for that reason you may want to do a multifocal IOL. There's also another subset of patients who would have liked um, multifocality with the best visual acuity at a particular distance for whatever task they like the best, for example for pay, playing golf or something. And they find that post the multifocal intraocular lens implantation, their best visual acuity is not at that distance. It may be, Maybe it was best, better corrected for near. So though that's again another subset of patients who might want to explain that IOL. How long do you wait to make sure if they are, they are going to neuroadapt if it's a multifocal? Well, I think you can give them uh, some time, uh, but maybe not too long because you do have to, if, if you end up having to explant it, then uh, you want to make it easy for yourself. So uh, three to six months, six months would uh, sometimes kind of be adequate for letting the patient figure out whether they uh, can handle that or not. If it's going to happen. If it's going to happen it or not, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, but uh, then at the end of six months, you would want to take a decision. Even at six months, fibrosis does start to set in, and it may become more difficult to take it out, but still it's not as bad as when you have to take it out years later. So you can generally uh, dissect that bag open with viscoelastic and gently tease the intraocular lens out and replace it. What about the late cases? You said earlier that in days gone by, that was a more common situation. You still see that, though. 
Oh yes, we still do see those late dislocations uh, so that generally happen in patients with some kind of progressive pathology. For example, they might be high myo pseudo exfoliation, that's a very common cause for late dislocations. Um, just some connective tissue disorders, marfans, homocystinuria, any of those conditions, retinitis pigmentosa. So you have so many of them, even patients with, uh, you know, who've undergone retroretinal surgery. All of these can lead on to a late subluxation or dislocation. And uh, these are generally in the bag uh, dislocations. There's also another subset who had a sutured fixation of a capsular tension segment to the sclera at the time of primary surgery. And over time, that suture degrades. And, you know, uh, over the course of maybe eight to nine years, it degrades. And that leads on to a late subluxation. So these are all uh, situations uh, which you have to handle a few years after the surgery is over. It's generally the entire bag IUL complex that's dislocated together into the uh, vitreous and uh, there are various ways to address that. Of course, sometimes you also have a capsular tension ring within the bag. So that's another thing that you have to handle. Uh, so uh, depending on what you're going to do, you could uh, either just uh, transfixate that bag IUL complex or the bag CTR IUL complex with a suture as it's uh, done very uh, commonly now. Or uh, something that I like, my personal preference would be to use a device which I have, uh, you know, designed, which is a paperclip capsule stabilizer. And the reason I like it because there are no sutures to handle. So you don't have to kind of manipulate or maneuver needles across the anterior chamber, which are sometimes difficult to do. And then tie down that knot, make sure you're absolutely centered before you tie down that knot and all that. So all those complications and problems which can happen with uh, sutures, you know, you might have a degradation later on. Of course, Gore-Tex doesn't degrade, but the other sutures, proline can still degrade over time. However, you can avoid all of that if you use this because this has a haptic and there's a paper clip component. So the paper clip clips onto the uh, rex's rim and you can just take that haptic out uh, through a sclerotomy and tuck it in. And the other beauty of this device is that you don't need to dissect the capsula bag so much because the small device, you just need enough dissection of the rim, uh, just enough for it to uh, kind of clip onto it. Well, we could talk for a long time about the actual surgical methods for the different kinds of explantations, but we'll have to leave that for another time. Absolutely. But we can direct the watchers to some of the videos that you've done on YouTube and elsewhere. Absolutely. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sean. For more information on this and related topics, please visit us at eurotimes.org.